This is a talk that I gave at NoSQL conference in San Jose in August. Um, at this NoSQL conference, people would, talk, would be talk, talking about uh, um, typical big data NoSQL solutions. Um, there were a lot of graph databases around, and there were people that were doing uh, semantic web databases or triple stores. And so I decided to give a talk where I talked about all these three different types of databases and when you could use them. Um, and so before I started, I started talking about a company, but I look at the people in the list that most people have been in my talk, so let's not talk about a company. Um, at the conference, I talked a little bit about um, for those people that didn't know about graph databases and triple stores. Uh, what the difference is, so I said here, here, this is how you represent data in a relational database. You can take the same information, and you can actually represent the same information as triples. And if you represent those triples um, as a graph, um, then you get something like this. Yeah? So uh, the information that you normally would put in a relational database, you can also represent, always represent as a graph. So that was my very quick introduction at the comments about graph databases compared to relational databases. Of course, I always have to say something about the difference between them. So what I usually say, well, a graph database or a triple store doesn't have any schema. Mostly you can just say what you want to say. Um, there's no link tables because in, uh, you can do one-to-many relationships directly. Uh, there are no indexing choices because most graph databases and all triple stores index uh, every predicate on the fly. So if you say that uh, person one likes a pizza, you never talked about likes before, then in the next millisecond you can say give me all the people that like pizza. And it's a, graph databases are a very low level way to represent data, so it basically takes, you can take almost every kind of information and turn it into a graph database. So that was my very quick introduction at the conference about uh, the differences between the databases. And then I talked about these three classes of databases, and uh, I started with the complex data, um, and, well, complex data is a little bit of a marketing term, but we in the semantic communi community know that we, what we do is complex data. And I always show a little picture here because O'Reilly came out with a fantastic book about the query language for the semantic web in Sparkle. Um, but everyone is wondering why they choose the most ugly fish in the universe as the front cover of the book. But anyway, so we in the semantic web com community know that complex data is really good at knowledge instead of data. Um, when you need to represent thousands and thousands of different classes of objects, where every object might have a different hierarchical relationship to other objects and different predicates and different kinds of attributes, then it would be almost insane to do it in a uh, relational database. But triple stars are really good at doing many, many types of objects. Uh, Semantic databases deal really well with the very stringy RDF, much better than graph databases, and were completely built on top of logic. And because in a, in a, in a semantic web database, we use unique URLs for every uh, node in the graph, uh, we actually, for us, it's very easy to link to other data sets. Yeah? So you can have data sets all over the world, and as long as people use these unique URLs, um, we can link them in one big knowledge graph. And then in the semantic web, we're really good at adder queries and rules and graph algorithms, and we're getting more and more scalable by the day. And at the end of my talk, I will talk a lot more about that. And it's all built in standards. Yeah, so that's a very quick introduction to complex data, or triple stores, or semantic databases, whatever you want to call them. Then the other class, oh no, sorry. So we at France well, sell a semantic database, but every time when we talk to customers about projects, yeah. Of course, they have read all the literatures, and they always say, so why can't I do this with a big data or no SQL solution? Or shouldn't I be doing this with a, a fast in-memory graph database? Yeah, so that's the question that I get most when I talk to uh, potential customers. Yeah, so let me take these two other classes. First, about big data. Well, everyone knows now that big data is far more popular to talk about than relational databases. This is a picture from Google Trends. And we at France live in the Bay Area, and what you see here is that we're about the one place in the world where people talk more about big data, actually, than about uh, uh, relational databases. But that's just a little artifact of where we live here. Um, and big data is really, really good at insane amounts of data. Yeah? It's, it is 
more flexible than a relational database. So you can work with relatively flexible database structures or data structures. If you want to add some new columns on the fly, you don't have to rebuild the whole database. By the way, that doesn't hold. I mean, that's not always the case. Sometimes when you want to do really different analytics, then you do have to restructure your data. Um, Big data is also good at finding a single object very fast. And you can do moderately complex analy analytics using MapReduce. But if you want to know when big data doesn't work really well, I would kind of suggest you go to this article here at the bottom of my page. There's a nice ACM paper that's done by uh, Michael Stonebreaker, who fathered a whole bunch of different types of databases. And he starts out by saying that on the one hand, Hadoop was fantastic because it brought parallel data process processing to the uh, Java masses. But he's a lot in, in, in science, and what they do is a lot of computations where you are in the loop. You do a local computation on some local data partitions. You get some output, and then you need to send or receive data to or from a such a subset of nodes holding other data partitions. Yeah? And, um, and there's a whole class of problems that have this characteristic. So he talks about computational fluid dynamics, uh, ocean simulations, sparse graph problems, image processing, etc. And then he analyzes why this doesn't really work well in MapReduce. But the main problem is in MapReduce it's hard to do direct node-to-node -node communication. I don't want to stay too long on this page, but I actually really advise you to read this article here. Um, this whole presentation will be available on our website, so you can find the link there. Okay. So now about the third class of databases, the fast data. Fast data is a new term that was coined by uh, Ofum, um, probably uh, paid for by Cray, who came out with Yard data. And, and so they needed a marketing term that made it look different from, uh, say, big data. And so they came up with the word fast data. And the first question is, do we really need these fast data uh, graph databases? Well, the obvious answer is yes, if you deal with graph, then the graph data is obviously specialized for that. So here are some examples. Yeah, Take, say, a query where you want to do some fraud analysis, where you want to know whether Cray and France would boost their revenues by sending each other money through other channels. And you could do a query like, OK, did Cray send money to D and E, yeah, applying to France, where France have sent the money back to some other partners, and the paths are not the same. But this is a this is a typical graph query, but someone with a SQL can probably still formulate this question. And um, uh, but if you get to a query like this, then it's nearly impossible. Say you want to find a path from France to Cray through the sent money. Credit, and the path has to be more than two steps deep. And there's a reverse path, and these two path, paths have an empty intersection. Well, if now if you're a SQL person, it's going to be extremely hard. And if you try to do this in a typical Hadoop or Cassandra database, it will be nearly impossible. This is a place where graph databases really shine. Yeah? And so if you want to read this report, it's actually a very interesting report. Uh, let me see here. I can't find my little pen here. Anyway, um, uh, this you can find this, uh, this report on the web. I think it's it's, it's open. And basically, the, the key sentence here is it's fast data products are delivered on the promise of velocity and big data by embracing many of the appliance-based in-memory or hybrid architectures of the ten SQL platforms to accelerate processing of variable structured data. So basically, that's the core of what the fast data does. And then that report goes on to talk about it's finally time for in-memory data storage and graph databases. But again, I'm not going to read the slide to you right now, but I'll leave it in my presentation so you can read it at these databases. And I tried to summarize it in this picture here. So if you have billions of same type objects and you need to retrieve them extremely fast or you need to do simple analytics, then all these databases are probably uh, good enough for what you want to do. But if you have a fixed size steady data set and you need fast graph computations and pattern matching, then something like this might work better for you. You could take a Neo4j or Lego graph or uh, Create Eureka. Um, and you can do your graph analysis, graph analysis fast. Then sometimes yeah, you need all the features of an enterprise database. 
and you need to work with ontology-driven knowledge base and rules, but also you need the flexibility of a graph database. And then you probably want a triple star like Allegro Graph or Oracle of Virtuoso. Yeah? So this is kind of a rough overview when you want to use what. But then sometimes there are applications where you need both the characteristics of big data and graph data and a triple store. And, um, and so we, we work with a customer on such an application where we actually were tracking um, entities, in this case telecom customers, in real time. But we're now also applying it to insurance industry, credit cards, uh, car parts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the core of the product is that you track entities in real time, and that for every entity, you build up a graph that can consist of thousands and thousands of triples. In the telecom space, we had the solution where we with, we identified about 40 different databases, yeah, events that happened in the real world, like telephone calls, like download of iTunes, like email, like paying a bill, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We instantly turned that information into triples, applied a whole set of business rules, and then finally we would have for every customer five to 10,000 uh, triples that described the customer in great detail. So we would have, we would for example know uh, all the people you called with and the frequency, and we could see who was the most important person in your in your, friend, in, in, in your group of friends. Uh, we would know what your uh, mood was. We, we know what the chances that you go from Sprint to Verizon. Uh, we know your plan and how well what you do fits with your plan. We know where you are on the typical Tuesday afternoon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all described in this graph. And the beauty of this is that the single graph is, of course, part of a graph of all the customers. So you can do analytics on a higher level of data on your graph. And for that, uh, again, you're in the middle of a big data application again. So we, for this project, I mean, you could use Hadoop, but the problem there is the MapReduce doesn't get you anywhere when you deal with the individual triples of an individual user. So for this, a big data solution didn't really help. An in-memory graph database would be really great except if you have, uh, say, more than 10 million or hundreds of millions of customers, then there's no graph database yet that will fit the, the entire graph in memory. And we solved it with the triple store. We had scalability on basically on the account of the user and the, and the IDs of the devices. And then what we do is we take a graph out of the database, put a memory cache by rules, uh, apply the prediction engine and store the changes. So we would do part of the solution that working on a memory graph and then part of the solution would be to do queries against the entire graph of all customers. Yeah? But it was still a big scalability problem. So at France we're now working on two alternative solutions to the scalability problem. We have a we have something called AG horizontal, which is a distributed triple store using the blue principles. Um, and where we automatically can take Sparkle and turn it into uh, intelligent uh, memory reduce um, operations. We have a tool called AG Vertical. This is a mostly in-memory triple store. You can store five times more triples. Actually, it's far more triples per gigabyte, including all the strings and indices. And it's programmable as a graph database. So let me talk about these two new solutions. So in each and horizontal, yeah, we um, use big data hashing ideas for partitioning. And we then the storage for, for every shard. And then we have a Sparkle one one and an almost complete Sparkle one one where we translate a query in a query flow graph and pipeline. So if you take a typical query like this, yeah, this is a simple query where you want to know everything about uh, certain proceedings written by a particular author, a particular title, etc., etc. Yeah, and this is the Sparkle query. We would turn it into something that you can't read right now, but this is how the query flow graph looks like. And let me blow this up a little bit. So in this query grow graph, we have um, about 13 different basic operations. We have a, a split operation. Uh, we have a merge. We have a left join. We have a right join. We have an optional join. We have a filters. And then some other types of, uh, of nodes that all can be uh, linked together in the graph. And then these uh, nodes are spread out over all the machines that you have, over all the shards that you have. And then the data will flow through this network. And what you see, for example, here, we started 
by doing a split on the first variable. And we said, OK, well, uh, we don't have to send anything to the first machine. We have the bound variable in proc to uh, well, 634 of these bindings have to go to the second machine, 789 to the other machine. Now, the second variable here will get bound from the original query. And the results go to a merge operation. And now we're going to split it again. And so what you see is that the, the, the query group, uh, it's a pipeline model where you push both the variables and the bindings through the pipeline. And, oops. and so here is a little, a little bit more. This is the optional part of the query at the bottom where we already have all the solutions, but then we also have to figure out whether the last part of the, uh, the query actually uh, held true. We find a few more additional solutions, and then we get to the optional end. So this shows how we, this is the kind of the time graph for how this gets executed. Kerbal means that you, that you send the, the queries to the various machines, and here the green part is where you actually execute. And so what you see that over time, we keep all machines busy all at, all at the same time. Um, here's another query that is completely different. Uh, it's a big union where you want to find every about one particular single person. And here you see that the shape of the query graph is much different. Um, and again, this is not the time. I will give another talk about how this architecture actually works. Just wanted to show you that. The, the, the whole uh, um, topology of the graph is completely different. Um, and, let me then, and, then, and then if you look at the time uh, diagram for this thing, you see again that most of the time, a lot of processes all are busy at the same time. OK, so this is the horizontal solution. Um, if you want to work with it, you need our professional services. It's not yet something that we send out. Uh, but if you're interested in working with this architecture, then uh, just please call us up. And then we have a solution AG Vertical, um, which will be the new storage layer for Lego Graph 4.8 online, the one that we have right now. And this will be uh, available as a, an, a, a beta in, in a few months. And we call this version AG Vertical. Yeah? Internally, we call it actually AIMS, uh, which means almost in memory store or almost in the microsecond which means that we can reach every triple in the database in about a microsecond. Uh, if we take, say, a billion triples, then the total size on disk is just 35 gigabytes. Yeah? And that includes all the strings and inverse indices. But for graph analysis, we actually mostly need one index called the SPOGI index. And that one is just 25% of all the space. And so we get to about 8.75 bytes per triple. So that is literally a breakthrough, at least in terms of size, but also what we can achieve in speed. Let me, let me show you what we did. So I was very much interested to see how much data, how many triples can we actually store uh, in memory and do complex uh, graph analytics on. So what I wanted to do is to compare uh, a Lego graph against uh, of the new AIMS architecture against some of the other available graph databases, triple source. So we looked at Stardog and UO4J. Uh, we looked at JAR data. Um, and we just were trying to see if you do this particular graph Africa algorithm, what is the memory footprint? And so what I created was a, a random graph with 10 million unique nodes and with 10 unique characters. And then you connect these unique you nodes know, to the predicates in uh, about 100 million relationships. And of course, if this is a generator, you can make it as big as you want. And then I did the Sparkle query, where I said, OK, I'm starting with a particular um, random node from the, uh, the 10 million nodes. I go to NY, I go to Z, I go to A, and then I want to go back to X. So I just want to find a little circle in my data. And what I want to do is I want to do this 10,000 times. So 10,000 times, I pick one node out of this, and then I, I go searching for the little circle. So with this model, there's no way to hide. Because if you want to do this fast in this incredibly random graph, you basically need to have almost every node in memory if you want to find a solution. And so 
we did a comparison. Uh, we didn't have available pre yard data, but we, had, we talked to some customers that estimated the size of yard data to about 200 to 250 bytes per triple. We had an installation of Stardog where the time to find 10,000 cycles after the third run of seconds is about 1,200 seconds. And in top, if you look at the resident set size and the virtual memory set size, you saw the memory didn't grow anymore after 20 gigabytes. So we kind of calculated the change to about 200 bytes per triple. New for j we created a cipher program. Uh, by the way, if I go back to this query, you see what I do is I actually don't care what predicate I use. Or I'm just this. I, I, I do care, but I'm saying here, find a predicate that will give me this particular thing. Yeah? So it could be any of the 10 predicates that I have. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of work on cipher, but it doesn't work with the uh, random uh, uh, um, uh, predicates, but anyway, we figured out how to do it, and neo for got it done in 270 seconds, and top didn't grow after about 21 gigabytes, so that's about 210 uh, bytes per triple. Uh, we used the traditional graph 4.8, and we got to about 118 seconds in 15 gigabytes, and then finally, the one, the vertical solution that we have that I just talked about with uh, using Prolog. I can do it in four seconds, and top is no bigger than 1.1 gigabytes. So roughly 10 bytes per triple for everything that you need to get it done. Now, if you, I'm, I'm have this uh, salt shake here, so take these salts a little bit with a grain of salt. Um, you want to try this out for yourself anyway. We have the Sparkle Cyber and Polar Code available on the website. So if you want to try it out, then uh, you can try it with your paper graph database and then try this out for yourself. And that is about it. Thank you very much. So any questions? So if you have any questions, type them in the question pane in the dashboard. Are databases versus the stores, are they the same? Um, well, they are mostly the same. Um, graph databases I mean, you, I showed you the picture where you can take any relational database scheme and turn them into triples, and the triples themselves form uh, a graph. You don't call them nodes and edges, the subjects, the predicates, and objects. Um, graph databases have a thing called hypergraphs, where you can, can say something about a particular predicate. Um, but with the triple story, you can use the fourth element of the triple to implement uh, a hypergraph. And then especially in our change architecture, you can make this as complicated as you want. The difference is that in a triple store, nodes are unique URLs. So these, um, so triple stores are really geared to stringy RDF. We have to deal with a lot of strings. Trying a graph database to store something complex like uh, the billion triples challenge, and it will be very hard to get all these long strings in memory and get them back very fast. And a triple store is actually built to deal with all these strings. So uh, that's one advantage of triple stores. And the other thing is that in a, the, the fact that you have unique uh, UPR, a unique uh, string, uh, unique URLs for every node makes it very simple to share data with other databases. Yeah. So in a graph database, it's kind of the graph nodes are local to your machine in the to store, the graph nodes are kind of global to the world. So I would say that is kind of a, a rough explanation of the difference between graph databases and triple stores. Okay, one question is, another question is, in the example shown, how would frequent updates to the graph affect the query performance? Um, Well, um, it, of course, depends on how fast you insert and how many processes you can use. But uh, um, if it's a reasonable mix, you won't see too much of a difference. Uh, if you cause incredibly high speed insert updates, then you get into locking issues, and you might get slower performance in your graphs. In theory, if you have a reasonable mix between adding and, and deleting and doing queries, uh, you wouldn't see big changes, especially because AIMS is built for this with a multi-process architecture, yeah, where we have uh, separate write locks and, and read locks. 
Okay, another, another question, question is, can I write my own graph, graph algorithms in a level graph? Um, yes. Um, so we, well, of course, you can write graph algorithms in uh, graph patterns in Sparkle, but that will restrict you in some cases. Um, in our product, you also can use Prolog, which gives you actually the capability to write rules, complex. Um, and because this AIMS architecture is a true graph database, you actually can use that first performance. So Prolog works really well to write graph algorithms. Um, but we also provide a, a JavaScript. We also have an, a compiled, uh, well, we have Java, a compiled JavaScript. So you can also write your own graph algorithms in, in JavaScript. Plus, we come with a large set of predefined libraries, like uh, the social network analysis libraries, like sort of, uh, well, uh, short path, uh, centrality in, in degree, um, finding leaders in groups, etc., etc. All these, all these graph algorithms are described on our website. Well, what is the biggest data set tested for AIMS? Uh, right, right now, now the, the biggest, biggest one that we've played with on uh, a um, on a 96 gigabyte machine is 4 billion uh, triples, 4, 4, 4, 4 billion nodes. And, and I could keep those all in memory for my graph tests. Right, right now we're working actually on uh, several other data sets to get it faster and faster. Okay. Um, so I guess uh, we can stop at this. Unless there's any other? No? Okay. Well, then, thank you very much. And I hope to see you next time.